Jupiter Broadcasting presents this show in mega stereo sound. This episode of the Linux Action Show brought to you in part by GoDaddy.com. Use the promo code Linux and save yourself some cash. And of course, from donations of people that are, it's like people get donated, you know? And it's free. It's free. It's tax, it's tax exempt. No, it's not. No, when you donate people, it is. It's tax. Right. You can't, Chris, you can't put a worth on person. This week on the GNU forward slash Linux action show. Richard Stallman joins us to celebrate our 200th episode. And we ask him about his hard stance on proprietary software and the unethical people who make a living from it. Plus, his thoughts on everything from the app stores to the Raspberry Pi. And so much more. Oh, this week. On the GNU forward slash Linux action show! And welcome to episode two freaking hundred of the Linux action show. My name is Brian. That guy is Chris. Hey there, Brian. My son, Dylan. Runs Linux. Of course he does. Yeah, I got him set up now with a laptop, because I've been trying out the new uh, 1204 Ubuntu betas. Yeah. And uh, you thought, let's see how a three-year-old interacts with Unity. And uh, I would... How's I would, he doing? I would it? show you, but that's him right there, using it right there. I can see it. Uh, he likes Tux Paint and uh, Tux Racer. Well, how can you go wrong with Tux Paint and Tux Racer? Yeah. Yep. That's just tons of fun right there. <laughs> good zoom sight. Thank you. Well, good job, dude. Dude, 200. I know. 200. So this is technically, was a season 20, episode 10. Yep. Uh, but 200 shows. You know what the next show is? 201. 200 first. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I had an idea in there for next week's show. I don't know if you saw it. They did not. Well, uh, I don't read. No, there's a new video game that came out, and the developers of it are fans of the show, and they stopped by the chat room one night when I was in there hanging out, and he started telling me about what they've been working on, and I got a highlight. How do you suppose you pronounce that? So, Zenotic. Zenotic? Zenotic. So I think maybe we should do a review of that in the future. It's an open source uh, free software. First-person shooter, and... Uh, I have seen this. And it's, yeah. like, it's like one of the few we haven't covered on the show, but it's totally, I think, worth a little attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Tons of fun. Big show today, B-Man. Holy moly. Okay. So we've got Richard Stallman on the show. Uh, he's going to come on in a little bit. And in fact, this interview, we recorded it just uh, just a couple hours ago, and it went really long. Uh, we, we, there was just, I mean, come on, we had Richard Stallman on the show. We weren't just going to say, hi, how you doing? Do you like waffles? And then hang up the phone. We had a lot to talk about. Mm-hmm. We don't have time for a news segment this no, week. It's a little we don't show. have time for news next week. Maybe there'll be more news. Maybe so much news will happen next week that the next week will be nothing but news. Well, Who knows I'll tell you though, happen. if you feel like you got, if you feel you got short on the news, go over to uh, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Tons of great stories in there. Vote yep. them up on there. We'll be doing the regular show format next week, but Absolutely. for this week with the special occasion of getting Richard Stallman on we thought we break format richard stallman interview show basically yeah, yeah. so yeah. lots to cover but before we get to that i want to say good morning including our picks coming up to godaddy.com and the beautiful danica patrick now here's the problem we're doing this show after what appears to be a massive hardware and or yeah. software failure we yeah. don't know what's going so I can't on show you how beautiful but she is. we can't show you screenshots right. of our screens right. we can't show you no. Anything no. but our ugly faces. No, no, to be fair. Which do not look at all like Danica Patrick. Brian. Look, look wait. Chris, take me, take my face. Yeah. Squish it with Chris's face. Think of how awful that would be. Opposite of that, Danica Patrick. Now, let me tell you something. I was just going to throw them all in a post so nobody knew. So, it so I screwed it all I, Yeah, I wasn't even going to say anything. <laughs> You know what? You still can. Yeah. And yeah. then it'll just really mess with people. Okay. That's perfect. Well, so... Uh, it's episode see, 200, dude. We can do what we want. If, uh, see, I wish I would have done something like where I'd had the entire broadcasting system hosted with somebody like GoDaddy, because if you use our code LINUX20, when you check out, you will save 20% on shared hosting plans. But friends, friends, don't stop there, because GoDaddy has a deal for the .co. If you use the code MARSH9 when you check out, you will get a .co for $9.00. And 99 cents. Nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. That's like they're giving them away. That's an outrage. It's so cheap. That's that's an outrage. Also, if you want to keep yourself <laughs> a little on the more anonymous side, keep things private. Free private registration. Oh, uh, that's actually that's you actually, get privacy for free. I actually got the codes wrong. The free private registration is March nine, and the dot uh, co domain uh, for nine ninety nine is cofeb seven. The important about here thing here is is that there are codes. You yeah. can type them in and stuff will happen. Just go check out our show notes at jupiterbroadcasting.com yep. and you can get all the got good the stuff codes there. in there. You can also use the code Linux to save 10%. Thanks, GoDaddy. All right, we got some app picks today. 
I want to start off a little different this week. Okay. Because it is our 200th episode. I don't want to do the Android app pick first. I want to do the Linux app pick first. Fine by me, dude. Then the Android, That's then fine. the other stuff. Okay. Linux app pick today is a game. We've talked about it a few times. Never. But we've talked about it a few times <laughs> on my blog. Here's the thing. I wrote a, I wrote a blog post a long time ago yeah. about ASCII games, yeah. about games that are all text-based. Yeah, yeah. And during that process, I found this game called ASCII Sector, and it blew my mind. Ooh. It's basically like Wing Commander Privateer, except all in text. That sounds cool. And then I started playing it, and I love that game. And I play that game whenever I get a chance, which is hardly ever, but I love that game. And I realize that it's been in my mind all the time, oh, yeah. but I've never actually said those I've, words into this microphone, yep, I don't think. I've been there. But ASCII Sector, uh, ASCIISector.net, it's amazing. It's all in text, runs on a bunch of platforms, of course, for Linux. And it's basically this, it's like Elite mixed with Wing Commander Privateer mixed with a bunch of other stuff. All in text. Way cool. I know it's text, but come on. Way cool. That does sound cool. Yeah. All right. What's your Android pick? All right, B-Man. This one is a self-serving Android pick. It comes from Shane Q in the IRC chat room and, of course, from other places, I would assume. And it is the Jupiter Broadcasting app in the Android marketplace. Shane's been working on this for a while, and he got it in the Android app market, which is totally awesome. And it'll stream live audio. And I even see options in here to really? stream live video and... Uh, I suppose if your Android oh. device is of a certain, if it's like probably 2.3 or above, and it supports can, RTP, RTSP you streaming. You hit the video, links to that, yeah. pops open the video player. Yeah, that's, that's really pretty cool. cool. Yeah, or it does the audio stream, which is awesome. And uh, so there you go. I will put links to that in the uh, stick that show notes. On my phone. It also includes a uh, you know, list of uh, episode directories with their description and all of that good stuff. So it's, it's a really handy app for people who want to get some Jupyter Broadcasting content on the go. And uh, they have an Android phone. And of course, Shane is an awesome guy. He put it in the Android app market for free. Because he's awesome. Yeah. I really... It's... That's great. Yeah, isn't that I awesome? got, I got to play around with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's way, way nice. All right, B-Man. Well, we got a big show to get into. But first, the random distro of the oh, day. Oh, yeah, random distro. And it's a good one this week. This week. And now remember, we're just picking random distros here. It could be a big distro, could be a little distro, but the point is to give a little bit of attention to a, to random, random Linux distros. Let me spin the spinner, Brian. Spin it. Totally random. Here we go. You guys can't. Okay, stop, right camera. Oh. It is. It's oh. Oracle Linux. What are the chances, Brian? Oh, look at where it landed. I know, right there. Right on Oracle. Oh, Linux. right on Oracle Linux. Oh my God. What can you do? So, um, well, everybody's got to go check out this distribution. Check it out. Now, here's here's the thing that I think would be hilarious. I link to the Distro Watch page for Oracle Linux in the show notes. I think it would be fantastic if we all visit that. If we all visit that, I think it would be the funniest thing ever if Oracle Linux jumped to number one on Distro you know Watch for hit rankings for the week. That'd be a nice 200th birthday present, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be Everybody, great? go in the show notes and click that link. That way, that thing goes up in the Distro Watch charts just as a as a happy birthday to Linux Action Show. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> like. Uh, Man. You know what? You probably know all about Oracle's Linux. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to really go into it here. It's, it's, but seriously, click that link because I want to see that number jump way up there. I don't, it just will bring a weird, funky smile to my face. Yeah. I mean, come on. Come right? on. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's totally ridiculous. All right. Uh, before <laughs> before we, we dive fully in. All right. So we got we got the the, the RMS, the Richard Stallman interview. Um, we, you know, we kick it off. We, we start asking him some questions. It's pretty, pretty great. It goes very, very long. Bear with us all the way through the end. It's worth it to it, stick to the end. It gets it gets interesting, I feel. Um, but I want to want to point out a couple of other things. A couple of things going on right now. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, if you remember from last week, we had the uh, Save My House from Apple.com thing right, going on. Right. Uh, that's still that's still going on. Um, still having a hell of a hard time with Apple. So uh, if uh, if you're feeling like spreading the word about that, go check that domain name out. And uh, also this week happened, we announced the winners of the Illumination Software Creator, oh, cool. you know, great application, uh, great app creator contest. Uh, some really cool stuff got added over there. So if you go over to uh, blog.radicalbreeze.com, uh, I think I even have all also have a link over at lunduke.com to some of that stuff. Some really cool open source projects built in Illumination. Uh, a couple of great Linux apps that do like cool app backup stuff. One oh, guy nice. in Illumination built this app that basically what it does is it backs up your uh, your app get repositories. Oh yeah. Backs it all up to a Dropbox account. Whoa. And then 
will resync down to a local machine. So you reinstall your machine, install your machine somewhere else, get your Dropbox going, boom, it'll grab the, the app list huh. off there, reinstall all of your apps automatically in the Ooh. background, and it'll also set up a cron job for you to continually update your app list. Ooh. Super slick, right? That is slick. Super cool. So a lot of really cool little open source projects there. So go check them out if you want to try any of those. Very cool stuff. That's all I have to say on that. All right, B-Man. Well, let's go talk with Richard Stallman. Welcome Richard Stallman to the show, and uh, we've got a whole list of questions and topics for him, but I know he also has some introductions he wants to do. Richard, welcome to the Linux Action Show. Uh, what's the sorry, name Chris, sorry, Chris. Oh, the GNU, right. the GNU slash Linux Action right. Show. Sorry, it's five years of habit, but I'm making the change. I'm, I'm working Good. on it. <laughs> Basically, in 1983, <clears throat> I decided I wanted to make it possible to use a computer in freedom. Now, since the computer won't do anything without an operating system, that meant we needed an operating system you could use in freedom. In other words, one that was free software, freedom respecting software. So I started writing one and I gave it the name GNU. So I wrote some pieces. I recruited other people to write pieces. Some pieces I found. In some pa cases, I convinced people to make their software free so it could be used in GNU, such as in the case of Berkeley, the people who had developed BSD, which was proprietary at the time. And in 1992, GNU was almost complete, but it still didn't was missing one major component, the kernel. And that's when Torvalds, who had a proprietary kernel called Linux, made it free software and it filled the last gap in GNU. And the combination is the GNU slash Linux system. So this is an operating system that overall exists not for a technical goal and not for a commercial goal, but rather so you can have freedom. And that's what it's all about. You know, the nice part about that is I like freedom, it turns out. Now, Richard, I wonder, uh, do you, 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 you touched on something there that uh, really resonates with me. You say its goal isn't commercial, its goal is freedom. But uh, right. <clears throat> you look at the technology landscape today, and you know, it's, you, you're well aware how many people are actually now making money off of free software. There's nothing wrong with that. Remember, I didn't say it's anti-commercial. The point is, most operating systems were developed either for a technical motive or for a commercial motive, but the motive for developing GNU was an idealistic political motive. Do you think it detracts so from that goal? So that we can have freedom. Do you think, do you think, the, uh, do you think it detracts from that goal? Well, it can in some cases, but it's a complicated relationship. You shouldn't think that either it's political or commercial. There's no, they don't add up to a constant amount. Mm. Uh, what we find is that in general, the free software community members mostly don't know about the goal of freedom and don't think about it. <laughs> right, right. And so they're very likely to do things such as add non-free programs to the system. Right. Now, this is not, it's not only businesses that do this. There are over a thousand GNU slash Linux distros and there are something like 10 or so that are entirely free software. Yeah, it's difficult to find them, yeah. Well, it's not that difficult to find them, but the po you can find them all in gnu.org slash distros. That's true. There you go. <laughs> the point is that who chooses them? The people who really care about freedom, the people who've come to recognize that a non-free program is an injustice. It's an attack on your freedom. Once you see it that way, you say, get it out of here. I, and you start being willing to go to efforts to escape from non-free software, mm -hmm. which is what this is all about. After all, writing the GNU system was a big effort that we made in order to escape from non-free software. But with most of the community not being aware of these ideas at all, you find lots of people who think only in terms of what's convenient right now. And then the businesses that maintain GNU slash Linux systems, well, they they offer what they think the users want. They're looking for success rather than 
uh, spreading the liberation of cyberspace. And sad to say, with the community as it is, they're right in believing that they will get more success by offering a system that's not entirely free. <laughs> but the result of this is to spread the same weakness. Because after all, the, the voice of the free software movement is not heard all that much in our community. The What people mostly formulate their idea of the goal from is the distros they see most people using and what they hear most people saying mm -hmm. about those distros. So most people who come into our community, far from being told, we've escaped from non-free software, we're free now, they hear, look at this convenient distro, isn't it attractive? And as a result, the weakness of the community propagates itself hmm. and our efforts are mainly dedicated nowadays to uh to informing people about the ideas that we built the system for hmm. do you feel that's a possibly a generational gap as well as uh, younger people move into uh this area that perhaps haven't been around since the uh, beginning days that they don't have an appreciation for it as much well so i don't know if that's really relevant <clears throat> at all i'm not sure it's any different now in this regard from what it was 20 years ago in other words it was that way already Right. Ah, okay, right. right, good point. Yeah. yeah. Now, this actually touches on a topic that hits really close to home for me. Uh, you know, I'm an independent software developer. You know, I, I earn my money selling selling software. And the traditional models, uh, I guess maybe traditional is not the right word, but the kind of the quote-unquote tried-and-true methods are as an independent developer, you make some shareware, you sell some non-free software, you sell a license code for it, uh, et cetera. How... How do you recommend to people like me uh, or like many of our, our listeners here who are software developers who earn their income selling, you know, games, productivity tools and whatnot well, that are not free? Instead of going into such length, uh, you know, almost lovingly describing this unethical practice, why not let me just answer? I would right. love that, actually. Go for it. Uh, what they're doing is unethical. It's taking away freedom from their clients. And I wish they would stop. In fact, I'd be glad if I could stop them. And I will never be one of their clients, and nobody who appreciates freedom, as I've learned to do, will be their clients except under duress. So no, I, I, I kind of get that. Be, I think that we should all make those businesses fail by not <laughs> buying anything from them. <laughs> wow. And okay. then they will need to find some other work, which and, means they'll be in the same boat with millions of other people. And I can't cry for them too much. Hmm. Now, it's true that the U.S. as a whole is the victim of. Uh, re unemployment caused by right. decades of right-wing economic policies, starting with the World Trade Organization and NAFTA. And yes, that's that's an that's an unfairness to everyone. Mm. But I'm not more concerned about. Uh, people who are unemployed and would like to be programmers than I am about people who are unemployed and would like to be factory workers or teachers or anything else. Hmm. And uh, if you can't get an ethical job developing software, then you better look for an ethical job doing something else. But in fact, most paid software development is development of custom software, not proprietary products. That's true. So what you said was the usual case is not really the usual case. The usual case is people are getting paid to develop a program to be used by one client, and that client is paying. And that can be done in a perfectly ethical way. Just deliver it to the client as free software, respecting the client's freedom, in other words. And of course, unless that client is a dope, He's going to insist on it anyway. <laughs> now, Richard, can I ask so you, do you feel that... The point is that if the software is delivered as free software, the client's still going to have to pay because nobody's going to write that specific software unless he's getting paid to. Okay, well... The clients just, know this. Just to so be clear. In that, that's most of the software development business, and it can 
be done as free software, and it won't change much as a business. Now, just just to, just so just so I'm clear, and just so you know, the listeners have it straight. What would you, so if if a if a if an individual builds, let's say, a video game for Linux or Windows or whatever platform Sorry, they're building for, GNU Linux. for what for 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 GNU slash Linux, <laughs> it's going to take me a while to get that. We're working on it. We're working on it. Well, that's uh, why I have to keep reminding you. No, nope, absolutely <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so you would prefer them to simply not create that that game or that application absolutely at all because who's going to use it only people who are willing to give up their freedom and the price that they pay to use it is their freedom so in effect that program although it may be attractive is really a trap it's okay. a trap where you lose your freedom. Now, let me, let me, and let me, I let me. think people shouldn't make traps like that, especially when they're successful. After all, if it were a total <clears throat> flop, it wouldn't be hurting anybody. But if it's a success, True. that means it's separating lots of people from their freedom. Okay. See, it, it's interesting. You know, I... As a, as a general idea, I totally agree with you on that. On the flip side, I'd hate to see the loss of of new creative works, uh, you know, new but video see, games. Are these like. re- would it really be a loss if you if it's something that you can only use by giving up your freedom? Would you use it? I wouldn't use it. I would say, damn, another program that's been uh, offered to those worse than suckers who are going to give up their freedom and of course released in such a way that I couldn't dream of using it. Okay. I think it's wasted effort or worse than wasted effort because it a, a waste after all is something that that uh, contributes zero value to society and the value of this is negative. It's negative in the freedom dimension. Hmm. So uh, I don't think it's a loss if they're not made. Now, what what do you think about, um, just, to, just to play a little bit of the devil's advocate, about the kind of growing trend of more games and applications being sold completely free of DRM, uh, you know, no license keys, etc. attached, and built to be as cross-platform as possible, to kind of give the end users as much freedom as possible about where they well, want wait, to wait, run wait, and wait, but it isn't. That's not true. Are they free software or not? That's the That's question. true. They're, they're not free software by the, well, then by the definition of free. Well, then it's not as much freedom but... as possible. And so then, then your description is, is not accurate. They're not being made to give users as much freedom as possible because they don't meet the basic standard of being free software. Okay. Okay. See, see, that's, that's kind of, I guess that's where I kind of sit is I like to be able to, I like to be able to put food on my table as a software developer. And I, well, I, I said, really want to do that by developing that. custom software. That's where most of the jobs are anyway. Hmm. But even I, just, if I feel you like that's a loss, though. Suppose I feel like... that the only way you could get a job developing software were to develop proprietary software. What would follow then? What would follow then is you mustn't do it. It's wrong. Well, what, let's let's just you know take the flip side of that. So let's say uh, there's a lot of free software development that's currently sponsored by larger companies, uh, Red Hat, okay. Novell, a lot of other companies. And now most of those companies also make uh, a fair amount of money uh, selling proprietary software and closed source software, such as Red Hat even does that. Now, do you still yeah. feel it's wrong, even though they they have done a lot for the free software movement? I know, but the proprietary software is not ethical. Would, would you prefer that those companies just simply cease developing proprietary software entirely, even if that yes. meant that the money would completely yes. dry up to the free yes. software development? Hmm. Yes. Okay. I can kind of because see the non-free kind of see software is unethical. I, I actually, I struggle with it myself, with Red Hat in particular, because I know they sell so much commercial software, and yet they're supposed to be such a figurehead. Well, wait, 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 you said commercial software. Right. Right, because pr- yeah, right. proprietary, non-free closed, software, non-free they sell software. Right, free because software. A pro- commercial means a program is developed by or associated with a company. It could be proprietary, it could be free. There are commercial free programs, and there are commercial proprietary programs right, right. and there are non-commercial proprietary programs too mm, sure so these are different dimensions any program developed by a company is by definition commercial but it might be free or it might be proprietary right, right but what you right. meant to say was that they develop lots of 
or, or they distribute at least proprietary software. Mm -hmm. And and it doesn't sit quite right. I with wouldn't me. It kind consider of me. using it. It's only used by people who lose their freedom. Hmm. It's true. Yeah, I, I mean, but yeah, you know, I mean, crowd, I mean, crowd, crowdfunding is starting to work. That's true. But do you think, Richard, that uh, the part of part of the mainstream use now of of free software and GNU slash Linux is the commercial environment, and and there doesn't seem to be uh, any consideration of of free software and and the values that that means in that environment. And uh, well, that, then they're fools. That seems to be the mainstream, but that's such a wide mainstream adoption now. And right. so uh, what? I just I wonder where we go <laughs> from here. Is, makes a good point. Do you I'm get, what you're you take about. your values from what most people are doing? I don't. No, I'm wondering where See? do you think? Where do I you don't think judge free... what's important based on what do most people think or what do most people want. No, you. I actually, that's one of the things I respect about you the most, Richard. Is that that's exactly how you are. I'm wondering though, where do you think free software goes in the sense of if a primary, if a, a huge usage of it is sort of locked up in these commercial interests? There's only so much that we have control over in some sense. I don't understand that. That doesn't. That seems like a a total change of topic. I don't follow you at all. Yeah, I am kind of shifting gears a bit. I'm kind of thinking. I'm kind of shifting gears. I don't to know the fact what that, even the middle of that sentence. You say it's locked up in this commercial context, right. and that means we don't have control over well, it. Well, take example. I don't of, understand. Well, companies like Red Hat and yeah. uh, Canonical and IBM, they all and and Novell, they all pay people to develop free software, but they're they're doing it under the interest of that company. They're only working at the directive That's of that okay. company. That's okay. What's wrong with that? I'm just. We well, still have, have control over that software because we as a community, maintain our own versions of it. Right, right. We can still study it and change it, and people do. Mm -hmm. So we still have collectively control over that software, as well as individually if we want to exercise it. Okay, interesting. So, now... Uh, it kind of it kind of feels to me, and and if I'm totally wrong and off base here, tell me because I often am. Um, it kind of feels to me that that the idea is really to put the the freedom, uh, the freeness of the software ahead of potentially uh, freeness in other regards. So, like, uh, I don't know way, what you, well, which other. Let me let me let me kind of, like, explain that. Yeah, I want to be specific here. So, so if let's say we take a company and we say, "Hey, IBM, uh, you need to stop." Stop making and selling proprietary, non-free software. And the net result of that is IBM has to downsize. The, the positive result there would be that there would be less non-free software being being worked on and hopefully more free software, which is a great thing. The downside would be very likely in a lot of these companies with how much money they derive and how much revenue they bring in from non-free software, I a lot care. of people would have to get laid off. I, you a lot, a lot of you're going over the same times. ground. You're I, trying I know, I know. to justify non-free software by using some of the money for something that's good. And right. I don't believe that that can justify the unethical practice of taking control over the users and subjugating them. And in particular, I think that unless you're a, that if you're wise, you will never use that non-free software. Unless if you, you know, if you value your freedom, you'll never use that non-free software. Sure. There are plenty of people that don't care about their freedom, but I'm not going to say, uh, well, if they're such fools, then they don't matter. Mm. I still feel bad when their freedom is taken away. And you can say that this applies to most Americans. After all, most Americans are not protesting in the streets when mm. bills are passed uh, allowing imprisonment without trial, uh, imposing a 10-year prison sentence on protests at certain that, that disrupt certain government events. Right. This was just passed. And so you see so many Americans 
failing to defend their freedom. And what should we say in response mm. to that? Should we say, well, since they're such fools, they don't matter. Mm. Why should we care if they lose their freedom? I don't think so. That's not loving your country. That's an interesting, you're, you know, Richard, I've never really thought about those two different worlds like that, but that's a very interesting uh, parallel you have there. Can we? Do you mind if we shift gears to some sort of topics like SOPA and and maybe your thoughts on on if if gov if the government of the if the government keeps taking actions like that, do you think there could be negative impacts on free software? Well, uh, of course, that's almost that question is. <laughs> I'm sad to say, a little absurd. It's like saying, uh, if uh, you know, if. Uh, California sank into the sea. Do you think it well, might hurt free software? I, well, it I, I'll would, give you my but background. It would be so. It would be such a big disaster that I wouldn't want to judge it in terms of a no, not secondary like that. No, I'm, like I'm that. pretty sure the headline on CNN would be "Free Software Takes a Hit" because California. Sank no, I was thinking like part of the thing they're trying to do with SOPA and PIPA is uh, things that allow them to have more power with patent violations, and it just no, seems no, like no, a no. tool Actually, they could use. SOPA and PIPA had nothing to do with patent law. I believe Zero. didn't didn't PIPA Zero. have. Didn't Zero. PIPA have something? Hmm. Okay, well, let's no, say... they let's, were concerned with copyright law and trademark right. law, Copy but so, not Let's take the copyright law. law. Let's take the copyright route. Somebody could take copyright claim, and it seems like that could be a tool that uh, anti-competitive business could use against free software, in my opinion. I'm just wondering well, if you share actually, that. Well, actually, I don't think so, but there is a different thing in those laws which would have attacked free software. Oh, okay. okay. And that was the prohibition on any kind of tool that could be used for copyright infringement or could be used ah. to try to disguise it well does that mean ssh would be banned who knows right because uh the mpaa has a history of trying to stretch every power that it gets yeah. so it wouldn't surprise me if they got to the point of trying to ban ssh ban vpn uh, there are countries that want censorship that mm -hmm. ban VPN, mm -hmm. and so why wouldn't the MPAA, wherever it gets power, ban VPN? There's not that much difference between censorship in the name of copyright and censorship for any other purpose. Right, right. And you, so I've noticed it on your... It would have hurt free software, but it would have been a much bigger disaster. <laughs> it, it would have been pretty bad. It would have censored all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Not only, you know, we don't have to look at the ways in which, uh, we don't have to just condemn SOPA and PIPA for the collateral damage they would have done. Their purpose is an evil purpose, and that is stopping people from sharing. Sharing is good, and sharing must be legal. To apply copyright to, uh, to individuals non-commercially redistributing exact copies, in other words, sharing, is wrong. And no matter what methods they might propose to enforce copyright against sharing, it's always wrong because the idea of stopping sharing is wrong. Sharing is good and it should be legalized. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this is why anything that the MPAA and record companies want we should reject. We should say to them, you have too much power already, so it's wrong to give you any more power. You say you have some problems and you want them solved. Well, we have a problem. You've restricted us too much already. It's time to take away the excess power you've got. I agree. I agree completely. So let's. Uh, that actually is a really good segue. I, I would love to to kind of get your thoughts on the tr the trend of ebooks currently, and and the ebook stores, and how that's generally working right now. I I, I kind of think you have a few thoughts, so I kind of want to just t pass it over to you on this. Well, uh, the case that I'm most familiar with is Amazon and the Amazon Swindle, <laughs> which is an ebook reader product which swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to get a book anonymously, for instance, perhaps paying for it in cash. Right. And the swindle eliminates that because books that are in print, in most cases, are available only from Amazon, and Amazon makes people identify themselves. That's true. That's very and true. And that's an injustice right there. It means Amazon has a giant list of all the books each user has read. 
And such a list, no matter who has it, is a threat to human rights. Mm. We shouldn't allow it to exist anywhere. Then there's the freedom to give a book to someone else, perhaps after you've read it. And the freedom to lend a book to various people. And the freedom to sell the book to a used bookstore. Amazon eliminates these freedoms with digital handcuffs, DRM, Digital Restrictions Management. That, in other words, the malicious features in the proprietary software in the swindle that are designed to restrict people. And they, they, they generally implement these malicious features in proprietary software because with free software, the users control the program, and that means if it's malicious, they can fix it. So anyone whose purpose is to restrict people finds that proprietary software is the only kind of software instrument that can do so. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they attack your freedom by using proprietary software because their purpose is to attack your freedom at another level. <laughs> that's, that's and then there's point. another m malicious feature in that software. A it's a backdoor. Do you, have you heard about the backdoor in the swindle? It, Tell it, me about it. In 2009, we found out about this backdoor by observation. Amazon deleted thousands oh, yes. of oh, yeah, right. books. Yeah, we did hear about that. It, thousands of copies of a particular book. And until that day, they were authorized copies. They had been obtained in the normal way directly from Amazon. And Amazon knew who had them, knew exactly where to send the commands to delete them. And you know which book it was? It was 1984 by George Orwell. Which is just funny. That's yeah. spooky. That's, that's right. kind well, of spooky. Well, they demonstrated it's an Orwellian Maybe, product. maybe they have an incredibly good ironic sense of humor, right. and they just thought no, that would be funny. I don't think so. They just happened to have <laughs> a, so a contract dispute with the publisher, <laughs> yeah. and they decided that they shouldn't have sold those books, so they retroactively unsold them. Now I turn them into unbooks. Now I'm a complete I'm in complete agreement with you on 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 all of this. Where um where I start to get uh, um a, a little hazy is is what to do in terms of digital books and have having ebooks. I think ebooks in in general in concept is great. It's just, you know, information that's that's on my computer, on my devices. It's it's fantastic. I it agree. lend it lends itself really well to the sharing and dissemination of information. Um now it's it's such a distinctly different medium from printed books. Do you think it is in any way okay to try and and I hate I, I'm I'm not a fan of DRM at all, but to try well, and emulate DRM is the, always an injustice. It, it, it should to, be illegal to emulate the um, uh, the existence of books. So try to emulate a paperback book, as in you can't sorry, make more I, than one copy, etc. No, that means nothing. I can't make sense of that, uh, but a, pay, a, a printed book you can read without proprietary technology. Right. And you can buy it with, for cash, and you can give it to someone, lend it to someone, sell it to someone, and no one can magically make it disappear. So are you and are you against if an ebook takes away any of those freedoms if it's a step back in terms of our freedom then it's unacceptable. So even even if you could buy let's say an ePub or a plain text file um but you couldn't do it with cash you would be against that currently. I wouldn't do it. Hmm. Okay. okay. I okay, won't identify enough. myself when buying a book. So Richard I'm kind of curious then But uh, on we... the other hand if they were sold in that, in those formats, maybe we could convince a bookstore to take our money and sell us copies. Right now, if I extrapolate this on the 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 environment that I'm more worried about, especially in, with its impact to free software, are these app stores now that almost all of them by default wrap their applications in in DRM, and they have these remote kill switches like the Kindle does, and of course. Uh, Google's and Apple come to mind, but the others are working on these software stores, well, actually, too. Actually, there are some free programs in Google's App Store, I believe. Oh, okay. There are some. Yeah, uh, but Apple prohibits free software. 
And I, yeah, and Apple I, I just seems to be more of the trend. Apple is in attacking users' freedom. I couldn't agree more on that one. And, this and, is why I condemn Steve Jobs as an evil genius who made the world a worse place. The, the cost is extremely high, I agree with you, and it's mo- the, the future seems to be trending more and more in this direction. Everybody these days wants to have something that has an app store. And uh, do, it, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. If there, is it possible to have uh, an app store world that is still financially viable sure. for these people, but sure. still respects well, freedom? How do you define an app store? If it's a, if it's a site where you can pay for a copy of a program, well... That program could be free software. It's not gratis, but it could be free. Not cash, though, most likely. Well, uh, that's a different issue. We need to set up an anonymous way to pay in the Internet. Did you follow Bitcoin at all? I know a little about it. I don't know how to use it. Right. Yeah. Bitcoin, I believe, can be used anonymously, although it's not inherently anonymous. Right, right. But, uh, but I don't know the details. I read them and I forgot. Okay. Uh, but basically, uh, we've got to make payment on the Internet anonymous, and we've got to make sure, at least anonymous for the purchaser, and we've got to make sure that those services cannot be cut off. You see, one of the ways that the Internet attacks our freedom is that uh, to do the things that we normally do in the physical world, to do, the, uh, to do comparable things in the Internet, requires the cooperation of companies, and they may refuse to cooperate. Right. We recently saw PayPal impose censorship on publishers. You know, I, I, in general, I, I generally agree with that. But honestly, from a purely practical standpoint, I don't see how it's all that different from the way the U.S. government works currently, where, where paper money is, is backed by privately held corporations Sorry, and the U.S. Sorry, you don't understand. Government. You don't need a company to cooperate for you to accept some dollar bills. No, that's, that, that's if you're true, selling books but... in a store, and people can come in and pay you money, and you don't need some company to agree to help you take that money. It, right. Accepting the dollar bills is, is purely based, basically an old barter system. Well, but then, but to be internet, able to do anything with that dollar bills. You need a company to do that. But to do anything with PayPal, the dollar bills, you have there are, to There are only a few that you could use. Mm. And this is why you have less rights on the internet than you have in the physical world. True. Yeah. Now, now, I mean, currently we, we do have, I mean, with let, let's say bitcoins would be a good example. And just to kind of, kind of give you a general idea here, I could send money to you directly. So basically you could say, here's here's an IP address I'll be at for this 12 seconds of the day. Just go ahead and and, and Bitcoin me yeah. however many Bitcoins. And in that way, it's very similar to handing you some some quarters or some dollar bills. Where it becomes an issue is, is the same for both Bitcoins, sending money through PayPal, getting some physical dollar bills in the real world. You still have to be able to exchange that for something. So I still have right. to be able to go and exchange that, which requires the cooperation of companies uh, or government institutions some sort of currency even, exchange. even when we're talking about dollar bills and coins i guess i don't see i don't right, really see I'm the not difference about that i'm not talking about that that's a different issue <clears throat> so i'm talking about the difference between using cash and what you can do on the internet Right, I guess that's where I just don't see the difference there. I, I, I well, don't see where well, they're see, all that different. I guess one I thing can is with go, cash, you can be more anonymous. I can go to a bookstore and buy books and pay cash, and the bookstore doesn't know who I am and can't right. find out who I am. Right, yep, that makes sense. Fair. I have no records of this. I can't buy over the internet that way. That's true. That, that's true. Why Buying I totally know this is harder. Okay. Richard, a, a lot of people wrote in and they wanted to know if you thought that uh, Microsoft is working on this new secured, restricted boot environment for Windows 98 that, that locks it down so that you can't load uh, an operating system of your choice Windows on the yes, device. Although that's, a, a Windows that's not a clear description of it, so let me describe yes, please do. what's happening. Please First do. of all, it's not for Windows 98, it's right. for Windows 8. Windows, I'm not a big Windows guy. <laughs> Richard, so I don't follow him too closely. Uh, no, I, I, well, they've gone everyone wants back to get about 90 though. years. <laughs> uh, so in any case, but let me explain what they've done. 
First of all, Intel and related companies designed a spec for secure boot. And what this mean, what this meant that there would be a feature that users could turn on where they would put in some signature keys and then the machine would only boot programs which were signed by those keys. Well, if this is under the user's control, then it's a security feature. And uh, so sure. we don't criticize that. But then Microsoft made a demand. And the demand is that any PC shipped with Windows 8 be set up with that feature turned on already and with keys in the machine to recognize uh Microsoft's official versions of Windows. Right. And the danger was that some of those machines would give the user no way to turn off that feature, and then effectively they would be tyrant devices that could only run Windows. Mm -hmm. So the FSF started a campaign, which you can find in fsf.org slash sb, where we ask people to sign and condemn that plan and demand that machines provide ways for the users to turn off that feature, or provide ways for the users to put in other keys so that it will be a security feature instead of a restriction. So we said, don't let Microsoft turn secure boot into restricted boot. Right. And just, and just and to, then, to point this out to our to listeners, I recommend campaign. everyone check that out. What? I just, I just want to make sure our listeners go, go over to the Free Software Foundation, fsf.org slash sb. And, and honestly, I think no matter whether people agree with, with, with Richard Stallman, with me, with anyone else, I think we can all kind of get behind the fact secure that boot. we do not want this secure boot. Uh, a quote unquote secure boot happening. So, well, no, secure boot is the base level feature which can be under the user's control. Right. But Microsoft wants to turn it into restricted boot. Basically, Microsoft wants to put its restricted boot down on your computer's <laughs> neck. Mm -hmm. But then Microsoft did something even more outrageous. Because remember, Microsoft with the with PCs in general didn't demand that they only be able to boot Windows. It demanded something slightly different, and the danger was in practice it would mean they could only boot Windows. But Microsoft's response to our campaign was they they made it explicit. They demanded for ARM computers that they have no way to turn off the restrictions and no way to add other keys. So they explicitly demanded turning those devices into tyrants. Right. And that's where things stand now. And we have a, another campaign. Actually, we have a contest hmm. for people to draw cartoons to <laughs> criticize this. Right. That's a and uh, you can that's find great. that that's in the great. same page, fsf.org slash SB. Okay. I'm kind of excited to see what comes out of that one. That, that could be a ton of fun. Um, yeah, the deadline, I think, is in a few days. Okay. Oh, so everyone who's listening, get on top of that if you've got some art skills, or even if you don't. Um, so, so okay. So along the lines of hardware, you know, I just have a little bit more I want to talk to you about, and then uh, we'll let you go and and get some uh, get, get some, some probably well needed rest. I think you've been traveling. So, um, uh, now hardware wise, what what hardware are you currently running that you can kind of give the the hearty badge of endorsement on? Well, uh, from the I'm standpoint? running a remote Elung which they don't make anymore. Mm, that's hard. <laughs> and they've designed a new machine, but they made a mistake, uh, basically, or, or it has a, it's a mistake from my point of view, because they put in an ATI graphics chip. Ah. And, uh, well, ATI mostly cooperates with the free software community, but there is a blob in yep. the driver. Right. And so at the moment, uh, it turns out those machines don't run with a free GNU slash Linux distro. Mm. And I hope that they will help fix that. Right. Now, have you, but, ha have you been following the, uh, the Raspberry Pi project at all? Yes. I know that it has a, a Wi-Fi interface that, uh, that's, 
requires non-free software. So I'm very disappointed. Mm. Okay. They, you know, they could have made something that actually I don't I don't think the Raspberry Pi has Wi-Fi at all. It's just there's a uh, well maybe it, wait maybe it's not it's I'm told it, it's some kind of network interface. It's there's not. an the, Ethernet the, adapter. The, the Ethernet chips that might yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I remember that it's the name Broadcom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds right. So maybe yeah, it's not so. Wi-Fi. Maybe it's Ethernet. What do you think, though? Is if uh, uh, projects like that seem like they could be uh, uh, great? Oh, sure. I mean, I'm the, I'm talking about details, mm. not the general kind of machine. After all, it's the details that either are or are not a problem. I guess the uh, the uh, live chat room says it's the GPU that's a Broadcom GPU that has the proprietary blog. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Pi. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. Someone knows better. So uh, that makes it a harder problem. It'll probably be uh, very difficult to run that machine with free software at all. Okay. Yeah. Now the, the Raspberry Pi, you know, it's it's you know it's got some binary blobs in there. Um, so you know maybe maybe not a full acceptance from the the free software community, but certainly the 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 open source general well, community I mean, are just you going talk nuts about over these sorts of devices. With me, why talk about them with me? That's true. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. We'll, we'll we'll leave that be. You know, I uh, you know that kind of that kind of wraps up the the big things I wanted to hit. You know, I my mind keeps coming back though to to how do we get. I mean, from a purely practical standpoint, developers to, uh, like me, independent software developers to be able to still support their, their wife and their, their children and keep the roof over their heads and food on their table, but still make the transition, which is important to a lot I of us, to free software. I think the question is based on, a, it includes, a, includes false claims. Mm, okay. You don't have to be a programmer to make money. And second, in this country, in the U.S. right now, actually, I shouldn't say this country, I'm not in the U.S. right now. In the U.S. right now, lots of people can't find work. So right. if that's true for some programmers as well, one can only say, well, it would be nice if the U.S. fixed that problem. But that's a much bigger problem than what we're talking about. Why should we treat it? Why should we be prepared to give up our freedom to help a few programmers find work if we don't? If we just ignore the fact that millions of other people can't find work, well, that's I don't see thing. why this should be more important for a programmer than for a non-programmer. But in any case. Uh, certainly, it can't justify non-free software, but uh, it's also not a necessary thing. You know, if suppose the worst, suppose that no one could get paid to develop free software, what would follow? Well, a what huge would follow is of, of software. Software we would, would have we have up. to wait longer for the free software we want, which would be so, which would be unfortunate. But it's not as bad as using proprietary software. I, I've got to go ahead so and take it a step keep further. In mind which is worse? I, you're you're totally right. But I think the length of time we'd be waiting for some of those free software packages that many of us would need would be so long we well, would wait, probably if you think die. It's too long. It write it yourself. Well, that's the thing. So, like, let's say, let's say you need a great video editing suite. So, like, so what we do it. here, that, that's that's just it. Is a lot of a lot of really talented free software developers have been out there working on some really interesting projects in this space for a long time. The problem is that these True. projects are so large; they yeah. require a very large commitment in time and manpower. Well, and they're most getting developers done, don't have and if you don't it. think they're getting done fast enough, work on it. The point is, your these arguments seem to be trying to somehow reach the conclusion that unless we come up with a better way of paying people to write free software than that excuses non-free software. Hmm. And that's where I, that's my main point of disagreement. Hmm. I, I'm not going to try to deny any facts that you see. And I'm not going to claim that I've got a, a way that will make it easy to raise money to pay people to write free software. We all know that there, to some extent, are ways to do that, and we all know that, that they're limited, that they're not as broad as we would like. So the real question is, what follows from that? And I know that 
I'm not going to use any non-free software just because it's advanced. That's not going to. That's not a reason why I should surrender my freedom. Hmm. So I don't want any of those non-free programs to be developed. And if they are developed, I know better than to use them. And I hope you will also know better than to use them. I hope you'll stop thinking of it as progress when they're developed. It's just a, it's just a, a temptation for people to lose their freedom. Now, when enough people recognize this, I think that crowdfunding will start working better. It's already working for some free software projects. But the more people come to recognize that, A, proprietary software is unethical, it takes away your freedom, and B, they'd like free software to be able to do some things, or they'd like to be able to do some things on their computer and they know better than to do it with proprietary software, then they'll realize they should put in money. Hmm. Now, here's, here's, here's a, a good thing to look at. I am terrible with my hands. If you put me in front of a chunk of wood, I could not create anything worthwhile out of it. I'm just terrible at it. If you put me on a factory floor, the factory would explode within 12 minutes because of something dumb I did. But I can make really good software. Now, from, from my standpoint, and from the standpoint of simply putting food on my kid's table, this is what I've got to do, because this is what I'm good at. Um, to me, it would I don't be... think that excuses making non-free software, but I hope you can find a job writing custom software so, so that you can at least be ethical about it. Are you, and I, I might be completely misinterpreting this here, but are you, are you actually putting the, the needs of having no non-free software above the needs of feeding my kid? Absolutely. I don't... I don't see much difference between what you're saying and what uh, uh, a thief or a swindler would say uh, trying to justify what he's doing. You're looking at it from Seriously? societal... Well, he's looking at it from a societal impact standpoint, right, Richard? Right. And I don't think that people can justify unethical, harmful activities just by saying, my kids need some money. Well, of course, the most, imp the most effective thing any American can do to reduce uh, ecological impact is not have a kid. That's another point to keep in mind. It's really important for people now, just in to be the clear, U.S. Do you, you, do you have, have, do you have children? Because, no. Mm. Because... Americans live in such a wasteful, expensive way and use more resources than people in any other country on Earth. Hmm. Every kid that Americans don't have is a big reduction in how much global heating there's going to be in the future, et cetera. So that's a, that's a, a solution that people should think of. Well, there's, I, I mean, you're, he's, looking at it, he's looking at it from an environmental standpoint. But that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I mean, I mean, total, total respect here. I just, I cannot wrap my head around the concept. I, I love, I love freedom. I love actual freedom. Mm -hmm. I love the freedom to accomplish my dreams. I love the freedom to see wait, my wait, wait, daughter that's grow not up. Freedom, that's a convenience. No, 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 no. no. It is freedom it is, is the act of being free. Uh, look, no. look. You, now, freedom I'm, means I'm, that you're not under someone else's power. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you like. No, no, I, it I, I agree with that. Doesn't mean you can do that. whatever you dream of. There are things in the world. I can't afford, and there are things in the world you can't afford, but that doesn't mean that we've been enslaved. Right. You can't measure freedom that way. It's a common mistake to try to measure freedom in terms of what things you could possibly do. But even for people who are free, there's still limits to what you can do. There are things that cost too much, and you couldn't do them. Maybe someone else could. And you've got to ask, is that really what freedom means? Uh, does a millionaire have more freedom than you and I? No, I don't no, think no. so, because I don't define freedom that way. Right. No, no, and, and I don't disagree with you on that point. However, within the constructs of, of our society, and by our society, I really mean pretty much every 
culture on the planet. I can, I can currently create software, and I can do my best to provide, you know, a DRM-free system, a, a system where people can run the software wherever. If and, it's and, not free software, then I don't think you're con- you're making a positive contribution to society. Well, you know what though, I make a positive contribution to my daughter. I make a positive well, contribution. I don't think that justifies it. That's the fundamental thing. Mm. Uh, the people who worked in Enron, maybe they said the same thing. You know, mm. the point is that if you if you buy into that argument, the conclusion it leads to is anything that's profitable is justified. Wait, 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 wait! Whoa, 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 whoa! Are you are you likening someone being completely upfront with people and saying, "Here, I made this game. You can buy it for this amount of money. Here's the details of the licensing. If you want it, great. If you don't, great." To people actually stealing money from people's retirement accounts. Like, I mean, is, are you saying that they're both unethical? This on, on, they're different, but they're both unethical. So, so complete honesty, but a choice of a different Dishonesty license is unethical. Dishonesty is not unethical. the only way to be unethical. I'm not saying that your business is dishonest, but I do think it's wrong. Hmm. So, so would you say it was wrong to or at least be... your hypothetical business? I don't know if it. I don't know whether this is real or hypothe- How much of it's real? One hundred percent real. One hundred percent real. I'm not a BSer. Um, how? Would you say it was wrong to be a painter and make a painting and tell people, please don't copy my painting? I think it is wrong because people should have the right to share copies of any published work. But what if the person didn't want you to? Like, I, I he has generally no right agree. to stop me. He has no right to stop you. Hmm. Because they have a right to have a copy. Be- because people have a right to share is what I believe in. To so, for instance, if you've got a, a copy of a musical recording, I think you've got the right to share that. Or, you know, the government disagrees, but I think the government's wrong. I think you should be able to share that. Look, I... I, I and- in, in regards, I think free software is great. I think free software is the way to go. It makes sense on a purely practical level in most cases. But you disagree cases. with my philosophy. Yes, and here's, well, here's why. Well, I'm here's not why. surprised. Lots of people do, but and uh, this is I'm honestly, not going to change my mind. I don't, I don't, Maybe I don't, we've I, gone honestly, around this enough times, because you no. see where I stand, and exactly. I, you've expressed where you stand, and uh, it, yeah. maybe we might as well move on rather than repeating it. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, you know, I really do appreciate you coming on. I think, I think that uh, that our audience, you know, really could use to to mm-hmm. have have this sort of exp- exposure to yeah. to your these particular are these thought. are issues that I think a lot of the community struggle with, Richard. So I think people want to hear your thoughts on it. So I appreciate you. You coming know, it, on. it honestly, it seems less like this is about freedom and more like. A gimme, like like we're not really talking oh, about. I'm not saying you have to write anything. Want. but I won't take it if it isn't free software. Remember, I wouldn't have had to pay to use Unix in 1983. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, but there's I a significance there. I wasn't willing there. to because it wasn't free software. Right. So I. Far from saying "give me," I said, "I'll give." I, I gave years of my time right. writing free replacements for the components of Unix, which is awesome. Which but is quite I awesome. I did it so we could have freedom because, although Unix was available, and by you know in 1983 it was only really available to some universities, but a right. few years later, anybody could buy a machine and get a copy of you a, a binary copy of Unix on it. Sure. Uh, but that's not ethical, so I treated it as non-acceptable, and I built a replacement for it so that we could have freedom. And I wish failure to any business that makes non-free software.
See, I guess I just come at it from the opposite and side I of things. Use like, that I want software. I want to see people succeed. Like if 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 Steve Ballmer comes to me tomorrow and is like and is like, man, I just want to make Microsoft bigger. You know, I'm like, you know what? Let's try and do it in a free way. Let's try and do it in an open way, and let's try and have everyone succeed. I don't want to see people fail. Well, if or projects they made it, fail. if they made Microsoft bigger by making the software free, I wouldn't criticize. Because what I criticize Microsoft for is making non-free software. Okay. And because it's non-free, I won't take it. Nah, fair, fair enough. You know, I think, I think fundamentally, um, while, while we may be working towards much of the same goals, I think obviously we, we disagree on these points because I like kids to eat. Um, but I want to thank, thank you for no, coming I'm on. Sorry, that's not an excuse. You can't make proprietary software okay because that way your kids could eat, which is an exaggeration anyway, because it's not the only way they could. It's just that you, if you got another job, it wouldn't pay so much. It would be more like millions of other That's, Americans whose jobs don't pay so much. Yeah, and while respect, that's unfortunate, that I think we and need ridiculous. to do something Just about ridiculous. that by, by improving the wages for most Americans and not by making a special exception for you. There's, there's, no, there's no special exception. This, this, this is all about helping people. I mean, this isn't about software. It's about people, right? I mean, I mean really. For me, it's about freedom for people. Freedom for people, not software. So in That's order right. to have freedom for people, Free software people software need to eat. users have freedom. That's I mean, the I mean, definition the, of free software, that the users have certain freedoms. It, it, it almost feels like you're you're willing to have less proprietary software, even if it means half of America uh, going onto welfare. And that just, to me, but seems insane. But that's ridiculous. Half of America isn't programmers. See, that's the, that's but, where you're exaggerating so much. But it doesn't. It's a it tiny doesn't fraction just of America programmers. that is that is programmers, and most of them are making custom software. So it's a tiny fraction of them In, who are possibly writing proprietary go. software. At Microsoft, a very small percentage of the employee base is programmers. If you took away their their let's say let's say you said get rid of all your proprietary software. Microsoft is a tiny fraction of the American workforce no, anyway. But, but around here, but around here it's huge. There are some 70,000 people in down in Redmond on main campus alone. Most of them would be out of work if you took away proprietary software. I'm not saying proprietary software is great. I, I what would I'm like saying it is to we need a solution. I'm not willing to use any proprietary software just to keep Microsoft's employees in a job. And I'm not going to encourage anyone else to use proprietary software to keep Microsoft's employees in a job. So if one of those employees came to me and said, you've got to start endorsing the use of Windows so that we can have a job, I'd say, what happens to you is not sufficiently important to justify the wrong you're doing. Huh. All right, Richard. Well, we'll let you go because I know it's getting late where you're at. And uh, I honestly really appreciate you coming on and having this great, great robust discussion with us because at the end of the By day, the way, there are people in Microsoft who are working on services, which are different issues. Right. Do you want to talk about that before we go? Well, I don't know. I just wanted to point it out. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we're good. All right. Um, but yeah, I, I do appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on. Go get some. Uh, go get some rest. I'm sure you're recovering from a little bit of jet lag there. But uh, um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks very much, Richard. We'll uh, look. Uh, we'll follow your stuff in the future. And uh, thanks for chatting with us. People want more information. They can look at GNU.org and FSF.org. We will do. Thank Sounds you. Good. And thanks. my personal site is Stallman.org. I follow that, and I like your political notes. I keep track of that as well. So happy hacking. Thanks, Richard. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Once again, I want to say thanks to Richard Stallman for coming on the show. You were a good sport. Um, I know we uh, <clears throat> definitely disagree on a couple of things here. Um, you know, I, I, yeah. I just want to—I want to actually want to talk about a couple of a couple right. of quick things based on that. All right. Um, I was a little disappointed at one thing. I feel like we didn't really get practical solutions and now mm. like i, I kind of went into this interview thinking and, and here's 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 my thoughts all right i went to this interview thinking i'm gonna directly ask richard stallman what i can do you know how how do i take a proprietary software business and move it 
You know, move it over to free software. I wanted... You were hoping for some ideas. I, want, I wanted some ideas. Yeah. And my thought was, and uh, total honesty here, my thought was, I'm going to disagree with some of his ideas. Right. I'm going to think they're crazy, but I was expecting ideas. And what I was going to do was, I was going to take those, and I was going to say, you know what? I'm going to apply that to one piece of my software and see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. I was going to take my game or something like that, and I'm like, I'm going to do what I'm gonna do what Richard Stallman thinks that should be done. And we're going to have a real practical, real world test of how well this works. And it turns out, Richard Stallman has absolutely no practical ideas for how to accomplish moving over from proprietary to free software. He just thinks my child shouldn't eat food. That or you kind of made have me started grumpy. to do it. I shouldn't have started in the yeah. first place. Like I shouldn't have created something new in the first place. But you know, I thought it was interesting. It does show that his his ideas are not just about software. It's about art, books, everything. He feels that once you create something, everyone owns that, mm -hmm. and it's not yours anymore. It's for the collective. It's for the collective. Yeah. And I guess that's that's where he and I differ. Uh, so I, I I think that's fair. I think it's fair that he feels that way. Um, I was just thankful to be able it's to hear his, his thoughts, and he is a he, you know the one thing about Richard Stallman is he does not filter himself, and he's just very honest with the way he feels. I about appreciated it. that, and yeah, and yeah. I also like you know he's he's a deep thinker. So even if on the face of something I don't agree with it, I if I stop and I kind of think about it in the way he's talking about it, I can kind of I often see his point where he's coming from and and see some of the genuine truth to what he's saying. But at the same time, I just feel like sometimes those are not practical things that you can actually apply to everyday life. Can I just say something, Chris? Yeah, B-Man. I 100% appreciate everything you just said, and I disagree entirely. I feel like his ideas are fairly simplistic, and he doesn't think through the practical application of any of it. Um, Maybe. Maybe. It, honestly, all the software developers in the world should should quit their jobs and, and not it's have extreme. work. And it's extreme. It's not just extreme, it's silly. Anyway, you saw the interview. You, re you listened to that in the car. You probably got frothing in the mouth angry either at Richard or me. Um, but uh, either way, it's interesting stuff, and I'm sure the debate will continue for another 300 years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Well, B-Man, so uh, the big show will be back at our regular time next week, assuming I get all of the streaming stuff fixed, because the streaming software also is manages the recording and the camera everything. switching and everything. It's all so, in one spot. In fact, probably a good idea to stay tuned to one of our many places you can follow us online. Either Let's the, just see uh, what's going to happen. The, the Linux Action Show sub Reddit or Google Plus or one of our social network profiles. We have links to those in the show notes because honestly, next week for the entire network could be touch and go. So check those Who knows? for status updates on, on shows for next week. But if you have trouble, like it, let, let's say everything explodes, you can't watch the other shows, you can just watch this one over and over again. It's true. That's yeah. true. Something you can do. If nothing else, we'll at least have this one. We have this one. Yeah, as far as it I know. It turns out the 200th episode of the Linux Action Show, the last show we ever do. <laughs> it might, dude. It's no, horrible. No, no. It's this stuff will get fixed. We just don't know how yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. we'll figure it out. Uh, also, I want to give a quick mention. We were we're going to talk about it, but with with Richard on here, we just wanted to clear way for that. Uh, I got my hands on the hardware that the Spark tablet is based off of, and I did an in-depth look of that. You can find us at Anything C71, and that's over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My review, did an in-depth look, tell you that's a little bit cool. about the hardware. It's and, worth checking out. And I think in the future on the show, I'll play with that open bootloader and really actually try to load some uh, alternative operating systems. Maybe we'll make a segment out of that for last in the future. I forgot to make Emacs jokes! I was gonna. I was all prepared to make Emacs jokes when I talked to Richard, and I forgot. Yeah. Damn. That's all right, B man. Damn. Maybe there's golden a opportunity wasted. Maybe there's the 300th episode. Did you think you'd ever come back on again? I uh, no. No. What if I promised to make Emacs jokes? Did I don't know, man. That? Maybe. He, he seems like he'd like a good Emacs joke. Uh, all right. Also, I put links. I put a new spot in the uh, show's uh, show notes called Chris's stash. I'm just gonna put links to stuff that I just randomly threw out there, like the in-depth like look. That. You'll find that yeah. in there. Yeah. Chris's yeah. stash. All right, B-Man. Well, I believe that just about wraps up this episode <laughs> of it. the GNU slash Linux Action Show. The GNU slash forward slash Linux slash Linux Action slash show. And we'll see you right back here, hopefully, next week. Yeah. I'm sure we will. Probably. Yeah. I hope so. Crap. <laughs> There's actually so many things. We had a lot of feedback from last week's episode. About the MacBook Air, because we, you know, called Linus about using the MacBook Air. Oh, about the Seuss logo in your shirt. I did. Dude, I got it.